Hello, everyone, and welcome to the C.S. Lewis Foundation's webinar series. We're delighted to welcome you today for our conversation with Brian Brown, writing and the problem of Christianity. We'd like to thank all our donors, especially in Cultivating Oaks Press, who made today's webinar and all our virtual and in-person gatherings possible. Thank you also to Matthew Clark and the sweet heirs who wrote and performed Pilgrims on the Way, the song playing as you joined today. I'm Amber Saladin. I'm the Arts and Ministry Director for the C.S. Lewis Foundation. And this might be your first time joining us. You are very welcome. Allow me a moment to introduce you to the C.S. Lewis Foundation. Inspired by the life and legacy of C.S. Lewis, we encourage and equip Christians to live out our faith within the world of ideas and the arts. The goal is for our programs to produce spiritually equipped and culturally literate Christians who are transformative in whatever area they may be called to serve. We meet in person in multiple locations around the US and the UK, including Lewis's home in Oxford, the Kilns, which we own and operate. Our webinar series partners with our in-person events to provide community and engage lifelong learning year round. If you'd like to go back and watch some of our previous material, you can access that on our YouTube channel. Uh, that also includes some of our in person lectures from previous conferences over the years. Some of our recent webinar guests have included historian Mark Knoll, poet Christian Wyman, Inkling scholar Diana Glyer, and theology and poet Malcolm Geit. Perhaps the most watched uh, video on our YouTube channel is an address that Andrew Peterson gave for us in Cambridge a number of years back, and he's been so kind to post it numerous times over the years, so you'll find it right at the top. Later, academic director Dr. Christopher Howell will come and tell us more about some of our exciting upcoming events. At the C.S. Lewis Foundation, we are committed to engaging the soul as well as the mind. And art has a wonderful way of sneaking past even our own watchful dragons. Uh, sometimes we sing a hymn to begin uh, these webinars, but tonight Brian suggested a particular poem, um, an excerpt from Paradise Lost by John Milton. So I will pray for us. I will read the poem, introduce Jason and Brian, and then we will begin. This is a prayer for artists from the Book of Common Prayer. O God, whom saints and angels delight to worship in heaven, be ever present with your servants on earth who seek through art and music to perfect the praises of your people. Grant them even now true glimpses of your beauty and make them and us worthy at length to behold your beauty unveiled forevermore through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So in order to make Milton even more beautiful, I believe we have a slide so that you can read along for yourself as I read from John Milton's Paradise Lost. The creation finished. Here finished he and all that he had made, viewed and behold, all is entirely good. So even and mourn accomplished the sixth day. Yet not till the creator from his work desisting, though unwearied up returned, up to the heaven of heavens, his high abode. Thence to behold his new created world, the addition of his empire, how it showed in prospect from his throne, how good and how fair answering his great idea. Up he rode, followed with acclamation, and the sound symphonious of 10,000 harps that tuned angelic harmonies. The earth, the air resounded, thou rememberedst, for thou heardst. The heavens and all the constellations rang, the planets in their stations listening stood while the bright pomp ascended jubilant. Open, ye everlasting gates, they sang. Open, ye heavens, 
your everlasting doors. Let in the great creator from his work returned magnificent, his six days work a world. This evening's Q&A with Brian will be moderated by Jason Smith. You may know Jason is one of our breakout leaders at the Writers Conference or from the Writers Track at previous fall retreats, or if you've joined for post webinar discussions as one of our discussion leaders. Jason serves as a strategic advisor and volunteer at event staff at the foundation and is a writer himself. He's authored several best selling books, including the much loved Fayborn novels, which I just learned I had a very special copy of one of them. And most recently, 28 Days to Save the World, a business book on crisis management and organizational culture, co-authored with CEO Dan Purvis. We'll say hello to you soon, Jason. Brian Brown is the founder and director of the Anselm Society, a Colorado-based organization dedicated to a renaissance of the Christian imagination. And you can see why we're very good friends. Since receiving his BA in political theory from Princeton, Brian has worked for various think tanks and as a strategy consultant with over 100 organizations in the theology, worldview, and culture space. He is a speaker and the author of numerous articles and essays. He was a contributing author to Why Place Matters, edited by Wilfred McClay, and co-editor of the Ansem Society's book, Why We Create. I'm so excited to have Brian speak to us on writing because uh, Brian is the reason that I started writing as he encouraged me to write down some of my thoughts um, to go and speak to the Anselm Society a number of years ago. So thank you, Brian, for encouraging me and many, many others. Well, I didn't realize that part of the story. Thank you for telling me that and thank you for having me on. Uh, all right, everyone, give me one moment. I'm going to uh, share my screen so you can have some visual aids because we're going to be moving pretty fast here. All right, I'm going to explain that title um, in a little bit, but first you need a little bit of background for where I'm coming from and what we're going to talk about. Um, I've always been interested professionally in productivity related questions. How do we burn as few calories as possible on the things that are least important? Um, and in 11 years running the Anselm Society, um, I have noticed a, some, some similarities between what I've noticed in kind of the, the productivity end of the conversation and actually the spirituality and theology end of the conversation. Um, the Anselm Society exists. It's not just an arts and faith organization. We want to help uh, more broadly Christians see and interact differently with the world. And I see a lot of disconnects between uh, the way that we want our imaginations to work, the things that we care about most, um, and the ways that we actually live. A lot of what I'm going to say today is actually fairly broad in applicability in terms of vocation. Um, so even if you're not a writer, I hope a lot of this will be helpful for you. But uh, we are talking specifically about writing today. All right. So imagine writers, that proverbial blank page. Um, you know filling it is hard. Um, you know that sometimes just starting it is hard. Um but what I want to do in this time is awaken you to something, which is that it is actually much harder than you've perhaps consciously realized it is. Your subconscious, though, is fully aware of it, and it processes that awareness in the form of anxiety, stress, identity crises, and so on. Um, filling the blank page as a writer of any kind is hard because the default habits of modern life train us out of generativity. And filling the blank page as a Christian is hard because life as you know it, including sometimes your habits as a writer, tend to push you away from unity with God. We struggle to put faith and craft together, even conceptually. Um, I don't think I've ever met a writer who was both a writer and a Christian who didn't struggle with this. Um, and when we try to do it in practice, we tend to build lifestyles according to the secular world's defaults, not God's. What I want to do in our time tonight is give you a vision for habits in which your pursuit of your craft 
is wrapped up more tightly in your pursuit of God so that your writing and your Christianity feed each other instead of fighting each other. So we're going to do three things and uh, we'll see how we do on, on time. First, I want to look at the default rhythms of life um, and how, the, how they tend to alienate us from the world and from our writing. Then I want to look at the instinctive efforts that we tend to make to try to build a writer's identity in the face of that, um, which can sometimes make the problem worse rather than better. And then finally, I want to explore a distinctively Christian creative identity and how that can actually join us better to God, to the world, and to our neighbor rather than alienating us from them. So first, let's take a, a hard look at you with your default settings. This is the you that you will be if you simply do what normal life asks of you without ever pushing back all that much. Um, per, um, and let's think about, first of all, just noise. Um, you're kind of conditioned by a lot of modern life, especially if you live in a, an urban or suburban context, to, you're conditioned to not pay attention. Um, I really like Matthew Crawford's book, The World Beyond Your Head. Uh, and in that book, he has this just terrifying little phrase. Like the minute you hear it, you go, oh, that's so true. He says, silence is a luxury good. There's noise all the time. There's audible noise. There's also visual noise, right? There's music in the background. There's bright colors and advertisements everywhere. The soul deadening muddle of cars and strangers buzzing all around you. And oh, by the way, the phone in your pocket, adding that layer of robocalls and spam texts and push notifications. All of this tends to deaden us to the world. You layer on top of that busyness, or on top of that noise, busyness though. What do we actually do in the midst of that noise? Um, well, now we're kind of conditioned to not have time for a lot of the most important things. We struggle to fit the most important things in. Our lives are built around career and work. Uh, if you have young kids, you've probably instinctively put your kids on the early stages of that same treadmill. Um, chores and errands get stuffed in around the edges, and there is uh, probably, for a lot of you, a ton of driving. And... Finally, you're conditioned to withdraw still further from the world as a coping mechanism for those two things, right? You cope by hiding behind headphones, um, by filling what time remains with what you call vegging. I don't even know how to spell that, mind you, but like we all know what I mean when I say that, right? The, the, the doom scrolling on social media, binge watching Netflix, um, just, just kind of chasing those those tiny dopamine hits that trick our brain into thinking, oh, the next, the next post, the next episode will will leave us feeling better. I just, I just don't have anything else to to give tonight. Um, the way that that Crawford puts this is that distractibility is the mental equivalent of obesity. We are incredibly distractible because between the noise, between the busyness. We want to keep the world at arm's length to some extent as a survival mechanism. That's not our choice. That's not us being terrible people. That's the hand we're dealt to a very large extent. I'm sure all of this sounds familiar to most of you, and I'm as guilty as anybody else. Like I said, this is the hand you're dealt. Um, but Josef Pieper, the German philosopher, calls this lifestyle, this back and forth between busyness and idleness, uh, the culture of total work where you are completely defined by your busyness, completely defined. You know, we meet someone new and we say, what do you do, right? By which we mean, how do you earn a living? Not more a more existential question about who you are. That lifestyle of total work, where we're either working like crazy or taking some kind of sleep or veg break to try to recover for the next uh, rush of busyness, um, that tends to separate us not only from writing, right, but also from God, from the world, from others, by ensuring that we have inadequate time, inadequate energy, and inadequate, inadequate attention span for them, right? So maybe your top priority on a given day is to write, uh, yet you find yourself cleaning the house or taking a nap. Uh, you actually sit down to write, yet you keep checking Instagram or getting distracted by chores. You get to the end of the day and between writing and Netflix, Netflix wins because you're tired. You say, I am a creative person. 
I am a generative person. I am a writer, capital W, right? And we say, I am a Christian, but our habits and our time investments not only say otherwise, they almost ensure otherwise. And then we hope that when we sit down in front of a screen and open up Microsoft Word, that magic will happen, that the you that, that's been sort of actively suppressed all day will come out. And sometimes it does, but a lot of the time it takes a lot of work, doesn't it? So what do we do in the face of that? How do we build a writer's identity in the face of that? I don't want to be on that treadmill. I am a writer, dang it. Um, if we're willing to push back a lot, sacrifice a lot, earn that identity by that time, um, the template that the world gives us, I mean, think of a, a lot of famous writers. Um, it's the same template as, as the world gives us for pursuing greatness uh, in any vocation. If it's, it's in, if you've seen um, the Netflix show, Queen's Gambit, about this fictional um, female chess master, um, almost, or, or any of the musician movies. Um, they're always the story of uh, someone separating themselves further and further and further from God, if it's relevant to the story they're trying to tell, from the world, from their family, from their neighbors, the just heedless pursuit of craft at all costs, right? I've called this session writing and the problem of Christianity because both the identity of the writer as conceived in pop culture and the identity of the Christian demand supremacy and only one can win. So I wanna look for a few minutes at this sort of heroic identity of uh, the writer as it affects our character through the habits it creates. I am sure the vast majority of you, maybe all of you, have not swallowed this identity hook, line, and sinker, um, but because it's, in, it's kind of the water that we swim in, we tend to absorb a lot of its habits and some of its assumptions. So let's take a look at this. It's got three, three pieces that I can see. Um, the first aspect of the heroic writer's identity is writing as calling, and it tends to separate us from others. With writing as calling, you're treating your writing as the reason you're on the planet. It's a huge part of not only your identity, but your sense of self-worth. Um, and this mentality tends to lead you uh, at least at its worst, to sacrifice the day-to-day -day priorities of other competing identities, um, son, daughter, mother, father, and so on. Um, or if you're not sacrificing them, at least you see them as in conflict, right? Um, it's Writing is the thing that we withdraw from people to do, um, and not just because it's an, an instinctively solo effort. The best example that I can always think of for this is the 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 character in Tolkien's short story, Leaf by Niggle, right? He's always agonizing over how much better a creator he would be if he wasn't constantly interrupted by, uh, you know, daily tasks and neighbors and friends and kids and so on. Um, or perhaps in your dedicated dedication to your writing, you tend to not show up for others who need you, right? Like your, your pursuit of the craft is that, uh, that headlong. The second aspect is writing as addiction which separates us from the world. Um, it's kind of, it becomes a mechanism for that because writing gives us a permission, indeed a mandate, I would say, um, to avoid uh, fixed commitments, relationships that challenge us, perhaps even the demands of our immediate environment. You might use writing to keep yourself at arm's length, busying yourself about it, resisting the kind of stillness that might force you to face the things you hate about yourself, um, resistance to painful transformation. Ways that I see this play out a lot of the time um, are I see writers who are not all that involved in church or who frequently flake out on commitments at the last minute or whose character flaws are things that they joke self-deprecatingly about but don't really bother to fix. The third aspect is writing as idle. In this aspect, you see the writing as yours, right? Something to be withheld because it's your inspiration, your dream, your idea, your career. Um, and usually I get to this part in a conversation and somebody, somebody's going, well, that, that at least is not me. Um, but let me ask you this. How often is the fact that you're a writer a blessing to your loved ones as opposed to an inconvenience? 
I mean, any any craft is an inconvenience to the people around you sometimes. That's that's inevitable. How how often is it a blessing? For you storytellers, how many children in your church have profited from that? Do you hold back from offering your writing to as a gift to those around you, saving it for a hypothetical audience? There's a legitimate place for private writing sometimes. Um, there's a legitimate place for writing as an active connection with God. But inescapably in scripture, love of God and love of neighbor are pretty inextricably tied up with each other, aren't they? With writing as idle, though, the most dangerous sign is that you hold it back from God. You ask him to bless what you set out to do, but you can't imagine who you'd be if he took your writing away. Um, if if we had more time, there are stories I could tell you that maybe we can get to them in the, the Q&A, but both my wife and I have have walked parts of that that journey. And we've seen both sides of, of that. What happens when you say, I, I don't know who I'd be without writing and hold it back from God. And what happens when we give it to him? Here's the interesting thing though, both that busy and idle dynamic and that heroic writer's identity as a response to it, encourage us toward sloth. I'm going to stop using that word though. I want to use the word that the church fathers used, acedia. Because when we think of sloth, we just think of, of laziness. Um, Rebecca DeYoung, who's my favorite contempor <clears throat> excuse me, contemporary scholar on the vices, um, says, no, acedia is not laziness. It's not depression. It's not tiredness. And it's certainly not actual rest or the desire for it. It is turning away from the demands of oneness with God. Because those demands create discomfort. Transformation hurts, right? In fact, when we're engaging in acedia, we can suddenly become very willing to do a lot of things like cleaning the house just because they are less uncomfortable than the thing we ought to be turning toward. So acedia can hurt us as writers by making us turn away from the fear or discomfort of the writing, right? We usually call this procrastination and we sort of giggle about it self-consciously. Um, we allow the fear of the work, right? It's not laziness. And it's not because you're disorganized. It's it's fear, it's discomfort. You're allowing the fear of the work to keep you from doing the work until a greater fear, last minute panic, comes along. That's acedia. But we can also use our writing as acedia. When we elevate writer to that position of primary identity, over our identity as, as Christian, if we hold it back from God, because we can then use both our idleness and our busyness, our writing busyness, to hide from God. Acedia fears being still. It fears looking in the mirror. It fears the painful times of transformation. Familiar pains and struggles are preferable to the unknown. And I call this out partly because I think acedia is perhaps the preeminent vice of our time, um, it keeps us from stillness. It keeps us from openness before God. Um, I think nearly all of us struggle with it to varying degrees in different ways. Um, but I also call this out because I think it illuminates a lot of why the habits and identity of the contemporary writer and the habits and identity of the contemporary Christian tend to clash. This is why Christianity is a problem for the heroic writer. Oh yeah, I had a whole, whole slide about all this. Sorry. Um, so I'll let you breathe there for a second because I hit you with a lot real fast. Um, so we got this dynamic, busyness and idleness. Um, we all struggle with it in different ways. We all feel like we don't have enough time for the things that matter most to us. Um, and at some point, and I think to a certain extent, um, I know I tend to think that a lot of that is inevitable and some of it's not necessarily inevitable. It's the result of choices that I'm making. Um, but sometimes it takes incredibly countercultural living to make a different choice. It takes a, a ton of sacrifice. So in the face of all that, it's hard enough to carve out an identity as a writer, but there isn't really a blueprint for the Christian writer end of it. Like, what if I don't want... I don't want to be the sort of the wrong sort of writer, but I want to be 
a person of God who's who's writing is a, is deeply ingrained in my identity with Christ. I see a lot of artists go from well, writers specifically, but I see this with a lot of artists of, of all sorts. Um, they they don't like the term Christian writer because they associate it perhaps with um, the Christian fiction industry of the eighties and nineties, or although there was some really good stuff in the eighties, I was just reading something the other day. Like I can't believe the literary standard that some of that stuff uh, had compared to some of what I see now. Um, but they don't like Christian writer. Like they associate it with just bad art. Um, and so they tend to settle on the notion of, well, I mean, I'm, I'm a writer who is a Christian, but you can probably see the, struggle there too, right? Because now the now the two identities are are incidental to each other. Okay, but what if we want to be writing Christians where the Christian is the primary identity, that's the noun, and writing is the modifier. Writing is part of how I do this thing I call Christianity. My identity in Christ is primary. I've surrendered my gifts to him to do with as he wants. Writing can become an ingredient that joins us to God, that joins us to the world, and that joins us to others. In fact, um, the creative identity itself is, I would say, Trinitarian. Offering It allows us to bring our full nature to God as an offering, not just our craft. God can live without your craft. God wants your heart, Right. At the Anselm Society, we have um, built on some conceptual work that Dorothy Sayers does in the, her book, The Mind of the Maker, to offer a framework that's we think is very counter to those unhealthy defaults that get thrown at us. I'm going to show this to you, and I want to say before I do that what I'm about to show you is not a sequence. Um, it's not a creative process, at least according to Sayers. It's... They're distinct, three distinct elements, not distinct set, steps. So first you have the idea, which Sayers says corresponds to uh, God the Father. We have, and, and this is what you mean when you say, I have an idea for a book. There is a sense, the book has not been written, right? The book does not exist. And yet there's a sense, book, poem, blog post, whatever, there's a sense in which it already exists in your, in your mind. You're conceiving of a finished whole. Um, and it corresponds to the father in the same sense that before God made the world, the whole thing already existed in his mind and his creativity meets our creativity through what we call inspiration because inspiration is not ours. That cool idea that just popped into my head, it came from somewhere more to the point. It came from someone. And so the notion of the idea as connecting us to the Father, we're joined to God, to the world, to each other through the sense of receptivity, submission, gratitude. I have this posture towards um, God of receptivity to inputs. Joseph Pieper uh, calls it silent confidence. Then we have the activity. And this is what we think of when we think of writing. The actual part where I'm at risk of breaking my keyboard because I'm hammering down on the, the keys and stuff is starting to materialize in a, a Word document or something. Um, and this corresponds to the sun, right? By whom all things were made. And in this part of the creative process, we are... Again, I see I just used process. It's really hard not to think of this as a process. Um, but Dorothy Sayers is most insistent, and she's thought about this even more than I have. Um, we we want to, we don't just want to say, God, I've got a thing. Will you please bless it? We want to we want to be united to Christ in sacrifice. We want to be united to Christ in his work. The work is Christ's. The burden on some level is is his. We are called to participate in it. And there's a sense of zeal that comes with that. I'm I'm joining Christ in his work and carrying um, something forward, knowing that he's doing the real work. I'm just 
sacrificing. I'm not sacrificing my genius. I'm sacrificing my inadequacy. I'm sacrificing my whole self. And then finally, you have the impact or the energy of the work, which corresponds to the Holy Spirit. This is when you finish the thing and you see it and you read this thing that you have made for the first time, and it has an impact on you, even though you just wrote it. And now, unlike at any other point in your process of creating something, it has, of course, the ability to impact someone else. And you created it on some level for that purpose. A piece of art is uh, arguably incomplete until that point in the process. And when the burden is on us, when we have the sense of, I have to do it, it's mine, I have to own it, I have to achieve my goal of whatever the, you know, being the great next great American novelist or whatever, um, you know, the burden, the pressure, that's pretty darn significant. Um, but when we have the sense that the Holy Spirit is playing a role in all of this, and we're offering ourselves to him, now we have this notion that we are we can be transformed by him through the process and the the burden of transforming someone else is on him right and that's not and that's not an excuse for bad art right it's not an excuse for poor standards ineffective for jesus is still ineffective um but but there is a sense of I bring God my best in sacrifice, knowing that part of the creative process is him accepting that sacrifice and completing it, not only making it something better than I could have made on my own, but making me something better than I could have made on my own. We're in this posture of Sabbath rest. And rest like sloth is a term that I think we... Um, tend to screw up a lot. Like we think of rest as more as idleness. But one of the best examples I've ever seen of Sabbath rest is that Milton poem at the beginning. That's There's this sense of glorying in God's work and glorying in what he has made, which is why historically in the, the Christian church, um, feasting is so associated with the Sabbath. We're rejoicing and celebrating and glorying in what God has done. We have this posture of celebration, not just rest. Our writing with ourselves is a gift of love to God and others. Okay, so how does this become something concrete? In this life, Christianity and writing aren't at odds with each other in this version of doing it. Um, but neither is your writing simply a propaganda instrument, right? You're not a Christian writer in that um, sort of sad sense. The dynamic of this way of living isn't the dynamic of busyness and idleness. It's the dynamic of generative zeal and Sabbath rest, of offering what you have to God in submission and sacrifice and celebrating and glorying in what he does with it. Mixing Christianity and writing is hard in the short run because Christianity demands total allegiance and figuring out how to fold a craft into that is a life's pursuit, right? But as the Christ, as the scriptures say, I mean, the older I get, so, so much stuff just comes back to Sunday school verses, right? When the kingdom is sought first, the rest gets given back and the real work of Christian writers begins. The way that Flannery O'Connor put it, which I just love is somebody asked her, how do you become a Christian writer? I don't want to contribute to what O'Connor called the body of pious trash that Christians were known for, uh, even in her time. Um, how do I become a Christian writer? And she said, the way to become a Christian writer is to be so deeply formed by the church that you no longer have to think about being a Christian writer. In other words, it's not a question of technique, and it's certainly not a question of propaganda or kitsch. And it's not just a question of trying harder. It's a question of submission because we're talking about habit changes and those are hard at first, but it's worth starting out and asking some application questions like with regard to the idea, with regard to just having the headspace to fulfill not my notion of my own potential, but God's notion of my own potential. 
how am I rejecting busyness and idleness in order that I might have silence to pay attention, to listen, to notice, to wonder? Do I have a rule of life that allows me to order priorities and say, oh my gosh, that thing that's like nine on my list occupies nearly all my time. Um, are there sacrifices that need to be made, including of things I'm, I'm assuming are non-negotiable? Where do I need to submit to God's authority? Where does prayer fit into this? What inputs do I want to habitually expose myself to, including uncomfortable authoritative ones like church or masters of my craft? With the activity, how am I offering myself to God? How am I training myself to participate in his work rather than just asking him to bless mine? What am I doing to wholesomely and actively engage with my environment? What am I doing to actively participate in the body of Christ? What does it look like to daily offer myself with my craft to God in sacrifice? What does it look like to create from a desire to love and bless God and my neighbor with my work? And finally, how am I giving God the burden of the impact, expecting and leaning into Sabbath? Am I asking God for transformation instead of shrinking from it? How do I prioritize this celebratory Sabbath form of rest rather than just idleness? And what does that look like for me? Um, I just went through probably an entire three-hour seminars worth of material in 29 minutes. So if your heads are spinning or you have a ton of um, yeah, but how do I apply this type of follow-up questions? You can be forgiven for that. Um, but that's why we have the Q and a portion with Jason. So I will stop there and let, and I will just stand up here for, for Jason's slings and arrows. <laughs> Brian, it's so good to have you with us. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for uh, compressing it down um, extensively <laughs> those three hours into these uh, into these 30 minutes. Um, for those of you uh, who are here with us, um, you can put any questions in the Q&A. It's uh, down there on the bottom, um, bottom left next to the chat function. Um, I will try to uh, work these into our conversation. Um, <clears throat> thank you as well for your enthusiastic comments uh, in the chat. Those were really fun um, for me. And, and I think uh, as, as one of the, the hosts and um, I think very encouraging to all of us here to, to kind of see you reacting. So keep doing that. Um, Brian, I, I wanted to start with this question for you. Uh, and maybe this is a prompt uh, for that, for the story that you teased earlier, but I wrote down um, this comment that you made, God can live without your craft, because as soon as you said that, uh, the question that immediately leapt into my head was, but what if I can't? Mm -hmm. Right. Because I, you know, I think for me, for the first 10, maybe 15 years of, of writing, um, uh, that was kind of my terror, right? Yep. You know, I, I, I feel that I must write. Will God honor that uh, with the life that he's preparing for me and the good works that he has prepared hand that I may walk in them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The, cause we're, 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 we're clutching for this confident sense of, of identity. And I think I, I, I won't speak for every, every generation, but certainly, um, I'm a millennial and my generation, we were all, even the ones who didn't have parents that were raising us this way, the culture kind of raised this way. The water we swam in, every Disney movie for 20 years preached this message. You follow your passion and that leads you to your purpose. I think I saw that on a Starbucks sleeve once, um, <laughs> right? Like that's, that's and, and what a lot of Christian churches have done is just baptize that. They've taken that notion of calling, this notion, I am on the planet to do a vocational thing associated with a career and probably income, right? There's this thing I love more than anything else in the world. And of course, as soon as I finish college, someone will pay me to do that thing, obviously. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's my identity. That's who I am. Um, if you go to a typical school in America, K to 12, that's, pre that's preached at you for what's that 13 years. And, um, that notion of calling as a singular vocational thing um, 
I've talked to several scholars, New Testament scholars who are vehement in saying that's nowhere in scripture. That's a baptizing of a secular idea. The notion of calling in scripture, aside from people sort of specially called by God to be a prophet or something like that, is pretty universal. Um, it's pretty rule of life oriented. God's at the top. And then you have um, priorities and, and responsibilities as a human. Uh, you know, family responsibilities and church responsibilities and civic responsibilities. And um, you actually get fairly far down in a list like that before you get to something that's unique to you. And I, I have met, I mean, I'm friends with a, a lot of writers that, that struggle with this um, because they've absorbed the writing as identity thing for so long. Um, but what we have seen, we, we have something we call our arts guild um, where we are, um, there's some coaching and, and teaching involved, but a lot of it is just creative community and encouraging each other and challenging each other. And one of the most consistent things that we have noticed when people are willing to take the thing they care about most in the world and essentially lay it on the altar, um, is that it, sooner or later, it tends to come flooding back better than they imagined. Because um, I think this was in the Rebecca de Young quote that I had on the slide for a minute, like we're actually holding ourselves back from God. We're actually saying to God, yeah, you want me to be something that is even better than I can imagine for myself, but I can't, since I can't conceive of that, I don't want it. Um, the super short version of my own story and my wife's story um, yeah, I was, if, if, if we'd done this in person, I'd had a little more time. I would have told the story at the the conference, but, um, and Christina gave me permission to share this, but this is, this was her 15 year journey. She was a writer was who she was. And then she started having mental health, uh, issues. She had to get a medication for those mental health issues and the medication destroyed her creativity. She couldn't think the way she used to think. We fell in love over ideas and we couldn't talk about ideas anymore. Um, cause she couldn't keep up. And so she had to wrestle for years with uh, the sense of inadequacy that came with that, but also the the who am I that comes with that. If not this, then what? And um, over the last couple of years, I've had a, a somewhat similar journey where health issues have severely hamstrung my ability to do the things that I'm best at. Um, and I have sort of a hero to to emulate uh, in, in in Christina because... The cool part about her story, um, which has a little bit more of a completed arc at this point than mine does, um, is that when she gave herself to, to God in this posture of total surrender, my identity is in you, you know, help thou my unbelief, essentially. Um, I mean, God spent 10 years building up, partly through suffering, but also through the development of other knowledge and other skills, um, this this incredibly wise, deep, rich, well-rounded person who's this pillar of our community now. And oh, by the way, when she had built this full-fledged identity like that, God then gave her the writing back. And now she has depth and context to her writing and nuance that would never have been there if it had only been a matter of technique that she'd developed. She's writing, she's doing the best writing of her life now. But it's because she's able to draw from the 10 plus years of um, suffering and soul searching. It wasn't just suffering and soul searching, right? But suffering and soul searching and skill development and relational development that God had put her through. Yeah. We're getting a lot of questions <clears throat> in the Q&A. And, &A. and uh, um, some folks have asked for additional resources. We'll try and put those in the chat. Um, and I'll just quickly, uh, or, or um, in the Q&A, you'll see some answers being typed there. So you can follow um, follow some of those, those answers to their sources um, uh, that Brian has mentioned before. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to focus on some of the, some of the discussion questions. Uh, um, uh, we have a question from Serena. Uh, 
asking to address possible differences in the in within this framework of writing in the problem of Christianity. Are there differences between seasons of learning one's craft or applying one's craft? So um, school, college, apprenticeship, you know, the 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 10,000 hours of technical practice mm -hmm. versus the seasons of mastery. How how do you see this kind of maybe playing out differently in those uh let's say two? Sure. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I think there's there's hugely a seasonal uh, component, and I think sometimes we put when we're putting so much pressure on ourselves to to form this identity to to put out work. When we think of writing as productivity, right? You get to the end of a day and you, or the, over or a week, and you say, "I wasn't very productive this week." Ooh, like that's a machine analogy. That's mm. you're not you're not a machine. Right, like go read Joy Clarkson's new book. You you are a tree, like or any other book on Christianity and metaphor. Like we're not machines. We're not made to be productive. We're meant to be generative. We're made we're made to be a part of an ecosystem and help things grow, not not just mm. fire things off. So not only can a a season be a season of learning or a season of skill development where not much writing is happening or uh, where you're just soaking up um, the best writers, right? I talked to one person last week who was had such a stack of classics that she hadn't read yet that every time she finished a classic, she was like, I have to read the next one. Mm -hmm. um, and she she needed someone to say, that's okay. Maybe you're just in a season of soaking up. That's okay. Or in a shorter sense, maybe taking a two hour walk is writing today. Yeah. Maybe reading someone else's thing is writing. Maybe talking to someone is writing because I mean, certainly in my, in my context, um, almost everything I write is both inspired by and then informed by five or six books I read over a multi-year period and three conversations I had in the last month and, you know, some combination of that yes. kind of thing. And it comes out as, Ooh, Brian made a cool point in his blog post or something. 10 other brilliant people all did amazing, brilliant things that resulted in me making one tiny little connection in my mind three years later that resulted in the thing, right? Yes. The inputs mattered as much as the outputs. Yeah, the 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 leaf mold of the mind um, that that Tolkien talked about, where everything that we absorb ends up going into, um, going into that stuff later. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to do a, a a quick one, and then I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Howell to come on and um, give us interrupt us with some announcements, and then we'll come back to Q and A. Uh, so <clears throat> Charlie uh, mentioned uh, or, or called out, you said there was some good Christian writing in the 80s. Suggestions, please. So what was that book that you that, that you mentioned earlier? That uh, I, I'm currently re reading um, Stephen Lawhead's um, King Arthur books. Oh, the um, is the Pendragon Cycle? Is that yeah, the Pendragon Cycle? I yeah. um, I'd read some of his other stuff when I was a kid and. I saw that the Daily Wire was making the Pendragon Cycle into a TV show. And I was like, oh, that's right. Pen the Pendragon Cycle was a thing. And I never read it. And I just finished um, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, which was well worth the thousand pages, but took me a while to get through. And I was just starting Father's Tale by Michael O'Brien, which is also a thousand pages. And I thought, maybe I'll just read a fun one in between that doesn't tax me quite so much. And, and I picked it up and I'm two paragraphs in and going, this is way more high level prose than I expected it to be. And they're, they're brilliant. Hmm. I'll have to, yeah, I'll have to go back and revisit Lawhead. It's been a while since I've, since I've read anything of his. Um, uh, with this, we're going to uh, hit pause on the q and I'm going to invite uh, Chris to come on and give us some announcements. I'm going to go off camera for this and uh, we'll be back shortly. Hello. Yeah. Good to see you all again. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. And um, uh, my name is Chris and I'm the academic uh, director. Uh, just here to run through real quick uh, a few announcements. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, I'd like to also thank our partners and volunteers that have made the webinar possible. Um, because of your generosity, we're able to shine a spotlight on speakers who are living the legacy of C.S. Lewis in higher, higher education, ministry, and the arts. Our goal is to equip and educate and encourage Christians to be salt and light in the culture around them. 
Um, if you'd like to support these webinars or the work of the foundation, please consider joining us by making a gift today through our website, uh, www.cslewis.org. And uh, we have a few events that I wanted to flag for your attention. Um, actually, uh, just coming up, the C.S. Lewis Summer Seminars this July, we're actually excited that they have uh, sold out. Um, so uh, if you're interested, though, they do come around every two years, so you'll have to pay attention for the next one. The program is a one-week uh, seminar in Oxford with uh, C.S. Lewis scholar Jerry Root. Part seminar at Lewis's Home in the Kilns, which you own and operate, and part a tour of Lewis-related sites in Oxford. And so, like I said, every two years, those come back around, so keep an eye out, and we're excited that this one has sold out. Um, after that, we have a few events and planning stages that we can announce. We just released a call for papers for our November uh, 2024. Uh, excuse me, sorry. Um, oh. Accidentally minimized this. <laughs> Here's a call for paper for our November 2024 C.S. Lewis conference in Amherst, Massachusetts, uh, November 1st uh, through 3rd. And we just signed our contract this week the Hotel, University of Massachusetts. Uh, the theme of the event is Longing for Beauty and Justice, Restoring a Common Wheel. The call for papers is on cslewis.org uh, backslash blog. We hope to launch the event website soon. Um, speakers include artist Bruce Herman, philosopher Margaret Hughes, and economist Jim Hartley. And then for next year, 2025, we are currently working with various venues in Belfast, Northern Ireland, to host our 2025 C.S. Lewis Summer Institute. Uh, the theme is Returning Home, C.S. Lewis, Roots, and Transformation. Confirmed speakers so far are Malcolm Geit, Alistair McGrath, Kirsten Jeffrey Johnson, Kurt Thompson, Amy Bike Lee, Crystal Hurd, and Alexander Smith. Uh, and more will be confirmed as, as we get closer. The dates are July 22nd to 30th, 2025. And so if you have any questions about any of these, uh, please join our discussion groups after the webinar, and uh, we'll be happy to talk to you about them. And then uh, we'll go ahead and send it back to Brian and Jason. Great. Thank can you. Can I can I piggyback one thing before? Yeah. Back at Jason, uh, on that um, call for donations that uh, Chris made, I just want to urge you guys. This is one of those things that you you sort of allow your eyes to glaze over on, or you think, I I'm not rich. My money doesn't make a difference, or something like that. But uh, this is one of those things where all the organizations that are in this kind of space, Christian imagination kind of space are small and have small budgets. And when even a relatively low number of people make relatively modest gifts, it makes a big difference. And even if, even if that weren't the case, speaking as a leader, just seeing new names coming in and saying, I care with my wallet that this continues. And Lewis, the Lewis Foundation is worth it. Thank you, Brian, for that. Um, <clears throat> we uh, we are almost out of time. We have uh, the option, uh, all of you have the option of joining us for ongoing Q&A. It's a separate link. So you will have gotten an email uh, from the Lewis Foundation with a link that will let you join uh, the Q and A afterwards, and you know we'll be live on camera. Um, we'll we'll break out into smaller groups, and we'll be able to continue having these conversations, discussing these ideas immediately after this. Um, well, I say immediately. We'll take a five minute break, uh, but then within five to ten minutes after this concludes, you can get on and continue talking with us. Um, <clears throat> I want to uh, I want to end on kind of a sort of a practical next steps note with you, Brian. And um, I'm gonna try and mush too many questions together in order to do it, okay? So- Excellent. Uh, so, you, so you made the point um, that that art is, is incomplete, or writing is incomplete until it reaches someone else uh, and has that impact. And I was struck by how different that is um, compared to like the the niggle approach from the leaf by niggle story that you mentioned mm -hmm. where he's you know he's always working on refining his craft and honing his painting and and it's and it's beautiful um but but no one is ever going to see it uh in in this life and that's kind of you know part of the tension of the story mm -hmm. um so thinking about that we have some people who have asked questions uh about sort of very practical next steps um uh, Mark asked for recommendations on for books on writing for those who have things to say but haven't started. 
Aaron asked about advice on applying to uh, journalism or a secular writing assignment in a professional context. Um, and then Charlie asked, and again, I said I was mashing way too much together here. Charlie mm -hmm. asked about, uh, <clears throat> you know, we want to write for writing's sake, but if we want to be read, we want to get the big deal, you know, the book deal, the story out in the bigger publication. Um, how can we adjust that to God's plan for our work? So I, I've given you way too much to deal with. Yeah. Um, but I actually, think I, th I think I know what I want to do with that, actually. All right. Um, so um, two pieces, I think, that address at least some of all of those questions. Um, the first is one one concept that we try to um, uh, introduce to our art skilled members at the Anselm Society um, is the notion of creation as a gift of love. Mm. Um, sometimes we just have something to say, right? Like there's just, there's a story in me and I want to, I don't want to write it. Um, and I'm not, I'm not disputing that. Um, but building the, the habit of creating with an actual person in mind, not just as a, a target audience profile. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm writing this piece for a specific person, whether or not it gets, um, published and, uh, just, Actually, if you if you um, shameless plug, if you check out Anselm's, we have two podcasts. One of them, Believe to See, literally just did an episode on this, and it's wonderful. It's full of story after story after story of what happened when people who didn't think their thing would would make a difference to a specific person did. Um, and I wasn't on it, so I feel okay saying that it was that good. Um, the but the other the other half of it though is. Um, I understand um, for at least some of us, we we have this desire for success within a particular industry. So if that means getting a, um, a, a book published, a novel published, for example, there's a publishing industry that goes with that. Um, movies, even higher bar, right? Um, I think we need to get back in the habit of creating small. Mm -hmm. Um so many of the the best and most important stories that have meant the most to people over the years, actually fiction and nonfiction writing, um, didn't get published in the author's lifetime. They did eventually get published because they were that good. And someone else found it and ran with it. Um, so I think, that, I mean, I was talking to, Lancia Smith, who was you know, one of the architects behind this conference that this 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 evening was originally going to be a part of, um, and I love the way she puts it. We need to stop creating for the gatekeepers. Mm. Um, like do that once in a while, but don't make it your life's pursuit. Don't create for the gatekeepers. You are a real person who has a real soul and body in a real place with real relationships, part of a real church. And those people need you much more than that gatekeeper does. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I have so much more to say, and I'm sure you have so much more to say. We have to end it here. Um, we are out of time. But thank you, Brian, so much for joining us and sharing this with us. Um, I uh, will pray to close us. And I uh, hope to see many of you on at the Q&A. Um, follow that link in, again, about five minutes. It won't be live right away, but in about five minutes, it will. Um, let me pray for us. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you that Brian could be with us. Um, we pray for uh, his health and Christina's health, that you would guard them and be with them. And we pray that you would use our investment of time here to push against Acedia and to make us writing Christians. In your name, amen. Amen.